My people, YET, the Haitian diaspora living in Haiti podcast today is a, another weekend where we have an opportunity to have an incredible Haitian American, uh, Haitian diaspora who is impacting Haiti. And we get to share that experience to our audience who are folks who are either looking to do something similar themselves or are still connected spiritually to the country and are just looking for inspiration, looking for that bit of good news in a world where it just seems the only thing when it comes to Haiti is the negative, right? So we're certainly looking for something different, something a little more engaging, something a little more proactive in terms of our mindset and in terms of stories, stories that we can use to, again, inspire us to make an impactful change. And today is, is something that's pretty special that we have this guest here, a, a story that uh, I can personally relate to quite a bit, but we're going to get into that. First things first, I have my fantastic guest, Mark Antoine, the pastor. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. Really, really well. Had a great week and um, glad to be back on the show with you. Uh, listen, it's uh, a lot of stuff's been happening uh, in, in the world we're in right now, uh, but nonetheless, we want to keep the focus really on folks who are moving that dialogue forward in an active way that can last truly, genuinely, multi-generational, right? And, 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 and I think we have somebody like that in this episode because uh this this well actually she's one of my top five favorite people in, in haiti i, I oh, promise wow. you <laughs> top five absolutely in my top five that's how it, right right because of the fact that first off uh you know, she is in a background so folks who don't know who, who listen to the show for a long time let me just give a quick bio before i i, I, I pr- pr- give her bio is that you know i one thing that allows me to do what i do in the country is that i am self-sufficient because I consult, uh, because my background is IT analytics, right? And so I do very high level analysis for, for companies uh, to help them improve what they what they do, right? And, and that's called data analytics and to the point where it's getting to a point it's called data science now, right? And then when I first got to, the, to Haiti, I was just, I quit my job and I was just functioning as a, as just, you know, focus on my business. But after so many, so, so long, I realized, you know what? I, things have to change up because uh, I didn't want to necessarily be incentivized to do things that, you know, was more focused on a dollar rather than my morals. Right. And so fortunately, given that we live in a world of digital nomad seat. Right. And that's one reason why one of our prior guests, uh, Junior JB, you know, was so important to give us you know his experience on that. And of course, you guys check that out. Uh, it allowed me to get back into that field and make, I'll be honest, you know, I'll toot my own horn here, but pretty good money. <laughs> and that's as, and it's that money that has allowed me to funnel and grow the different ventures I do. And one thing folks don't understand, I, I haven't shared actually, is the fact that COVID hit me hard to the point where I actually lost my uh, my job, right? And my, my the, the consulting I was doing. But very recently, I've, I've gotten something new, something that is, is I'm very excited about. It's, uh, it's still in line with uh, data science analytics. And in fact, I'll, t- I'll tell I'll tell you guys a little later in the, in the in the in the show, but it's something very in line with our guest and what she does, and so that's one reason why you know uh, our guest is, is such a favorite of mine is because she's in the domain, and on top of that, she's decided to bring that domain of analytics and 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 data science to Haitians because it's something that it's an avant garde industry, it's an industry that uh, really uh, has left academia and a lot of folks behind and folks trying to catch up to it. And the fact that she's trying to bring it to Haiti and keep folks current in this sort of high level critical thinking, right? And she's doing a way where she's engaging uh, businesses in uh, in the country to not only get a lot of these uh, folks who are coming through this program that she's establishing and giving them jobs, right? Of course, you know, if you're on here and you're one of my favorite people, it's going to be, that's going to be that connection, right? And so, and so again, without, I can't, with that, I may spend the whole episode talking about her. So let me just bring her on the stage now. <laughs> Castaline Tilos, how are you? Yes, I am well. And I want to say thank you for having me on. Um, this is truly, truly a pleasure for me to be on with you both. <laughs> and um, welcome, welcome. You welcome. And and as I you know built up, is you know, you're you're well, who you're with, the organization, the, the entity. Is IT analytics right? How, how would you define IT analytics? Just really quick, is it a training program? What what is it exactly? Yeah, that's a good question. IT analytics is Haiti's first data science lab, headquartered in the capital city of Port-au-Prince, um, and we are an education platform. We're a consulting agency, 
Um, and we do public research. So we have those three pillars all within the domain of data science. And we're, we're bringing that to Haiti. Fantastic. Okay, a data science lab. Okay, all right. That's that's a very clear, un more understandable way to, to understand it. And so we're going to get a lot deeper into it. Because even <laughs> even my my family, when they try to uh, describe the the sort of domain that I, I am in for time, anyhow, uh, they I just tell them to tell people we we do, we do IT <laughs> just to keep it. But we're going to really get into the science of it. But first and foremost, I want folks to really get to know who Castellini is, her background. So so run that from the beginning. Um, were you born in Haiti? Were you born in the States? Run that, run that for us. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give you the, the long version. <laughs> so I was born in New York, but raised in Haiti. Um, so I spent the first seven years of life in jean Bel Haiti, which is a small town in the Northwest department. Um, I am from a family of plantain farmers. We actually are a few generation of farmers. Uh, but my parents wanted better for their kids. They wanted better for me. So at the age of seven, they sent me to live with relatives in the States. Um, so I spent the end of my childhood and teenage years in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, so I am a South Florida Haitian through and through. Um, and I have very fond memories of growing up Haitian in South Florida. So um, I grew up going to the flea market on Saturdays, going to church on Sundays and school on the weekdays. Um, some would say the three core pillars of um, l'école, la caille, l'église uh, <laughs> were the centers of, of what it meant to be Haitian for me growing up. Um, I also have very fond memories of traveling back to Haiti. Um, so one thing I should mention is that my parents have lived in Haiti my entire life. They have never left Jean Abel. Until wow. this day, that's where they live. Um, wow. So they would send for me every summer to visit. Um, every summer up until I graduated from high school, I would spend a few months with them in Jean Abel. So I have fond memories of of traveling to Haiti, doing the long trip from Port-au-Prince to Jean Abel, which takes about nine hours. Um, and in those nine hours, I got to see such a beautiful country. Um, so often you would hear the narrative that yes, Haiti is poor. Yes, there is sort of inequity. Um, but I, as a kid, got to see some of the beauty. We would drive along the ocean for hours, drive through mountains, drive through rice fields, salt mines, things that I didn't know that Haiti had, um, I got to see firsthand as a kid on that trip to Jean Abel. So um, again, summer spent in Haiti with my parents. Um, the rest of the year spent in South Florida, which is Haiti away from Haiti, it felt like. Um, so culture identity wise, um, I say that I'm Haitian American, uh, but sometimes I feel more Haitian, more American, depending on the day, the mood <laughs> and where I am. Yeah. Um, but having my parents sort of be in Haiti was one thing that kept me sort of connected or tethered to Haiti. I always felt that I would return because they were there. Um, and so for me, returning made sense because that's home. That's where parents are. That's where family has always been. Um, okay. So yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that's the early years. Interesting. Okay, and, and so are your folks still in that area or? Yeah, or, so mm -hmm. to date, they're still in Jean Abel and we, we keep close contacts so via WhatsApp, um, I get pictures all the time from my parents. Um, yeah, so they, they've they lived in Haiti so long that even now as they, they do have their residency, um, I don't know if they would want to acclimate to living in the in the US, so. Now let me make sure I understand this. So you were born in Haiti, but then but then you moved to New York. So how did that, how, did they, you grew up with an aunt or how did how did that happen if your parents were, were uh, in Haiti? In Haiti? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's fairly common um, to send your kid to live with relatives um, in the state. So I grew okay. up with an aunt and uncle in South okay. Florida. Okay, okay, just um, making sure. <laughs> I understood <laughs> that. Because anyone who folks think you're like, oh, it's a home alone. Uh... No, no, no. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, gotcha. Now, just, just a note for, for, for those who are listening in that may not know the geography of Haiti, Jean Abel is in the Northwest department, Northwest. And it's probably, Northwest is probably if one of the, if not the hardest department to get to, if you're driving, yeah. it is a nightmare. <laughs> and so um, kudos to you. <laughs> so Northwest being closer to Cap Haitien or is it more port au -Port yeah, port is the closer to port Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, you know, that direction of port au I understand is, 
still pretty pretty rough road wise. Still one of the uh, in terms of the road network, still one of the most under, underdeveloped. Still, though, even though the, I think believe the the president, the wife's president currently is from there, and I heard there's some, a big push from her <laughs> finally get some a little bit of development in that area. Interesting. So, so, yeah. so you grew up in South Florida, right? So that means you what you did your schooling, you did your uh, academics uh, out out there. So how did that how did that pan out? Did you so you finished your high school? You know where where did the schooling happen? Yeah, um, I guess I'll complete the story. So I did my elementary, middle, and high school in South Florida. And I remember wanting to leave for college. Um, I had a guidance counselor tell me that I should dream bigger and that I could aspire to go to one of the more reputable schools um, sort of in the States. So I did my undergrad and graduate studies um, in California. So um, my undergraduate degree I got from Stanford, um, which as I'm saying now, I'm not believing it happened. But um, I was fortunate to have gotten the full ride. Um, awesome. And yeah, I packed up and left for the wow. Bay Area at age 18. Wow. Um, and I remember my parents being incredibly proud because the, the reason why they sent me to the States was to benefit from um, better education, to, to make a living for myself. And for them, getting that acceptance to a major university was validation that what they did paid off. Um, wow. And so my, my parents were incredibly proud. Um, when I told them I'd be going to college, I'd be the first to, to get a college degree in the family. Um, until this day, I think they're bragging in John Bell about me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I did um, my undergraduate studies in international relations, uh, my graduate studies in international policy. So I often, I say that I'm a development specialist by trade, that ever since I could remember, I thought I would go back to Haiti um, as a consultant for USAID or the World Bank. I thought that was the only way that I could affect change. Um, but I wrote my graduate thesis critiquing these very organizations. Um, and so now I found myself working more so in the private sector in Haiti. Um, that's, that's fantastic. So so from what you said, South Florida, but because I'm, I'm a South Florida guy myself, uh, where in South Florida were you growing up? Or, yeah, uh, you... Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So not oh, too far Florida. from Miami. Oh, you're a 954 girl too. Okay. Well, where specifically yeah. Fort Lauderdale? Um, Lauderdale Manors, it's not the best area. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I was in Deerfield, Pompano. So that's no wonder I like you so much, Cass. We have that very close connection. <laughs> Which high school did you graduate from? Um, I went to Dillard High School, if anyone Dillard, knows the area. Dillard, right up the street. Yes. Right up the street. Because I, I spent a lot of, a, quite a few years at Blanche Eli, uh, about two years at Blanche Eli before I transferred to Pompano Beach High School. And that's where I graduated from. So no one, no, I was figuring out you know, so basically, we, we we can do a lot of the uh, Broward South Florida dances if if the if the music the right music comes on, right? <laughs> That's good stuff. Good stuff. Okay, so from Dillard to Stanford, fantastic. So you did you said you mentioned undergrad. Did you did you do any any further schooling? Um yeah, so I did my graduate studies at the Middlebury Institute. Okay. Um, it's a graduate school also in California. All right, and and um, so was it all in sort of statistics and and um, because analytics is not a, it's not a degree, it wasn't a degree yet, right? It's probably the degree nowadays, but so what was the what was the the specific major? So international policy and development. So I mentioned okay. that I, I don't have a formal degree in okay. data science or analytics. It's something that I acquired through working in the industry. Mm -hmm. So um out of grad school, rather than work for the IDB, the World Bank, sort of the ideal employers uh, that were fitting for my degree program, I pivoted. It just, I decided that I would work for a data science consulting firm in DC. Um, I got the job because I had done some survey research in Haiti. Um, I taught myself how to program in R. Um, I took some statistics courses in undergrad and graduate school. So I had all of the qualifications uh, to work for them despite not having the formal degree. Okay. Um, so I spent uh, two plus years working for the data science firm in DC uh, before pivoting uh, to IET analytics, which is where I am now. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, the reason why I was asking. We're, we're going to lead into why I'm asking these questions, these very point background questions, because I usually don't get that deep into it, just because it's interesting to know. Because uh, a lot of times, the, those who most fluidly transition to the analytics do usually do have some sort of either computer or math based background. And so, uh, international policy. I was just going to ask, you know, did it have some sort of incorporation of data points? But it sounds like you you went out your way to kind of incorporate that into the into the science. Okay. All right. All right. Good to know. 
Yeah, I wanted I to ask. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask um, before we transition in, into the next part. I know we're talking a lot about the education piece and, and the data piece. Um, but you said you left Haiti at seven. Is that correct? Yes. And you grew up in Haiti and you left Haiti at seven and, and then went to school in, in the U.S. And so you, you, I, I guess, did you, were you speaking English when you, um, when you left Haiti or did you learn English when you arrived? No, that's a good question. So I, I learned English once I arrived. I actually remember being teased by some of my schoolmates then. I must have been in second grade, um, but I was put in the TESOL track, um, given that, again, I didn't speak any English, but within a few years, I was fully bilingual. And if anything, now English is my stronger language. <laughs> right. Um, and, and, and the reason I asked that is because you mentioned that sometimes you feel, depending on the context and situation, you may feel more Haitian or more American. And um, I find myself kind of in the same boat. When I'm in Haiti, I feel more American. When I'm in America, I feel more Haitian. How has it been for you in that tran you know, that transition? Socially, how, how do you feel? And I also, when people ask me, what am I? I say Haitian American. But how, 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 do, how do you feel in that mix? Because you kind of already had that growing up in Haiti background um, before coming to the States. Um, yeah, I was gonna say growing up sort of binational has caused a number of identity crises for me um, that on my trips to Haiti, I would often be reminded that I wasn't Haitian enough. Um, but it's strange because all of the things that held such like negative connotation. But for me, I, I didn't want to accept that because in the States, I'm proudly Haitian. I rep my Haitian flag on like May 18th. Um, so being having my core identity robbed like or pulled in from under me mm. uh, was hard to deal with mm. with each trip to Haiti. Um, and I remember people telling me, even the way I walked, all of my mannerisms were very American. They were very blanc. Um, and I would actually right. fight back to try and prove my Haitianness. I remember eating from different vendors on the streets thinking, if I could prove that my gut can tolerate anything, <laughs> then I'd be or, brave. Very brave. <laughs> How did that work out? <laughs> not well, not well. Um, but as I grew older and matured, I realized that I don't necessarily have to prove anything to anyone. Man. Um, Amen. That identity is very personal. And if I felt that I were Haitian, no one could tell me otherwise. Okay. So now if people tell me that I'm like, okay, that's okay. Can you understand me? Can we communicate? That's all that matters. And so now I think, um, I'm not going to lie. 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 I'm I feel Haitian regardless of where I am. And I'm willing to sort of, I know that there are shades of being Haitian. So I'm not, I'm not as Haitian as the Haitian national who was born and raised there. Um, but yeah, we can be differently Haitian and still sort of claim that identity. Yes. Um, <laughs> Preach it. We, I mean, yeah. Haiti, you know, Haiti will be in a much better place when we can remove this designation of diaspora and national native, right? Because at the end of the day, we are all Haitian and we all inspire a better Haiti. And so long as we share that, you know, it shouldn't matter. I know other other groups don't have those sort of delineations necessarily. You know, for example, Israel, it doesn't matter. You know, as soon as you land, if you're Jew of Jewish descent, you are a citizen, you can enjoy full rights. In fact, they'll go out their way and, and I don't know if this policy still exists, but for a long time, they would actually give you stipends to, 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 to live and stipends to um, to start businesses, right? If you, as soon as you land, because they understand the importance of um, the skill sets you may have had abroad and the fact that, you know, the country at that time in development needed it. And so certainly the day Haiti can take that sort of pathway, uh, we'll, be gen we'll have a generally growing and improving society. So, but, but in any case, until that happens, we got to independ independently and individually uh, engage in the country. And that's why, you know, we're happy to have you again, Cass. And so, you know, you worked professionally for some, from, so it sounds like some boutique data analytics or data shops, right? So explain that process to us. Like how, what were, like, wh who are they working for and, and, and what were some of the different things you were doing and for how many years did you do that? Um, yeah, so uh, before I talk about uh, where I was prior to IT analytics, I'll just give some context as to why data science at all. Um, so I, in grad, Graduate school, I did my graduate work, my graduate thesis on people's perceptions of NGOs in Haiti. Um, it was a survey research done by an anthropologist um, who wanted to gauge people's sentiments. So what do people think about NGOs in Haiti? 
can we do a, a representative survey in the South? And so I was one of the researchers that they hired to do 800 surveys in the South Department of Haiti. And after doing uh, the summer of, of research, I became fascinated with survey data um, to capture people's perceptions and sentiments. Um, I published my findings, um, presented at conferences, and that's what really gauged my interest in data. Um, it was human data, not necessarily digital data. Um, but through pat the path of doing survey work in Haiti, I began to explore what alternate options there might be. Um, and I discovered that there were firms in the US uh, doing survey work for political campaigns. And so um, out of graduate school, I applied to work for a political uh, data science firm called Blue Labs Analytics. And that's where I was for the past two years. Um, so they do sort of, they consult for major campaigns. So they, they survey voters um, and then build models to predict a voter's likelihood of voting Democratic or Republican, also your likelihood of, of joining a union. We built several sc scores essentially to predict individual level behaviors um, for different constituents, different types of voters. Um, so I stumbled into that for a few years and I managed to sort of teach myself a number of skills. I remember on day one of the job, I told them, you know, I'm not a statistician by trade. I'm not an economist. I'm not a computer scientist, but they said you can think critically and the rest you'll learn. So I actually am really fortunate to have had sort of them as an employer to believe that I can learn to program really well, um, that I could teach myself SQL, Python, R, all the tools necessary for the trade, that for them, what they really valued was critical thinking. And I think I demonstrated that I could do that decently well. Um, and they, they took a gamble. Um, and I think that set my, my career off to where I am now. So I was able to acquire those technical skills while working in industry. And this required late nights, <laughs> um, a lot of Coursera um, and other sort of MOOCs, um, relying on my peers at work. Um, it was a, a rough first year um, until I felt like I had mastery of the different tools um, to where I feel like I'm much more comfortable and I, I actually want to grow continually in the field as well. So fantastic. I like that you mentioned like these little points because you know myself, <clears throat> if I have an undergraduate and graduate degree in economics and uh, and, and it through even throughout, I did use a lot of these programs. you know, for example, my undergraduate thesis, I used R, I was a stata. and then certainly for my graduate thesis, same thing. Um, was very analytical, analytical based, and had to do advanced analysis. In fact, you know, we had to write multiple papers for our graduate program that was very, you know, pretty advanced statistics that we had to write and like pump them out pretty quick. So coming out of it, you know, what was funny was I was so fatigued with with this the rigor of an, an analysis because we were calling it analytics at the time. It's analysis. I was like, yeah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> In fact, it burnt me out so quickly because I was supposed to actually I got accepted at law school. You know, I, did, I took my LSAT and the original, original plan was to do my graduate and then jump right into law school, got accepted at law school and everything. And, and I was like, you know what? I can't do any more school. <laughs> my brain's fried. And so, and so literally uh, I um, uh, decided, you know, I jumped right into work professionalism. And uh, in fact, I worked for a little bit as an auditor for auditor for the state of Florida uh, as a bank examiner. And so we were, literally I would travel the state and audit banks, which was interesting, but even that was too much analysis for my very fried brain. <laughs> now on top of that too, I found that I was very much connected with the people I was auditing. You know, there's, you know, cause you're auditing bank people who are actually very much making today, today, it's a very people based business development based sort of, um, um, bit, uh, industry nowadays. And so that's, I, I ended up flipping over and for over, over a year, almost two years, I was on the, you know, I moved to Chicago, was running, almost running, I was running my bank, own bank branch in Chicago. And so, um, you know, and, but until then, but it took about two years for my brain to unfry and, and then the hunger for higher level thinking re-engaged me. And, and it was after two years, then I was fortunate to, to take my, you know, step back into it by becoming a strategic marketing analyst for aerospace manufacturing company and doing a lot of high, you know, sort of high level analysis to help them with their revenue flows, operations, et cetera. And, and then from there, I've been in the industry since in, in different places. And so, but it's, it, but, but you're so right though, because it's not necessarily about um, having this, the statistical and exp exposure in school. It's more about the capacity to critically think that is, 
what data analytics and data science. I mean, that's what it, being an analyst always has been. You know, you know, mm -hmm. in the '90s, just you're, you're hiring. What you're doing, you're hiring somebody who can critically think, and 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 you can pa you can delegate critical thinking as a senior executive, senior manager. It, that's what you're hiring. You're hiring somebody who can you can delegate critical thinking to, which is not an easy thing, right? To 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 be able to trust somebody to do honestly, you know. Because I can tell you one thing that Haiti is, it's very difficult in Haiti Haitian society from the business sector is that. You know, there is no middle management or even senior management. There's just the, the boss and everything has to funnel through that one top level person because there isn't a culture as in other more developed, you know, countries and, 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 and academic academia that allows folks to be hired based on their capacity. In fact, one of the biggest criticisms of the Haitian educational system is that it, it teaches people how to remember, <laughs> and it doesn't really push critical thinking as as the states does, right? And so yeah. uh, I gave a long rundown, um, but you added a, such a fantastic. Part. I wanted to elaborate a little bit there. Uh, and by the way, I, I I go. I'm so used to calling Castellin Cass. <laughs> you you folks may hear me say just Cass. Um, so so thanks for that, Cass. So so yeah, you're hired for your critical thinking, and you ran. You're gonna say something. Go ahead. Yeah, I, was gonna say, I wanted to respond to that. And even within the, the, the startup itself, Blue Labs, that most of my colleagues were from the humanities. So they were former psychologists or uh, social scientists who pivoted into data science. And I don't know if this has been your experience, Chris, but um, a number of sort of practitioners in the industry, they don't have proper degrees in the industry, uh, but they wander into it um, by pure interest and curiosity um, and some then go on after working in industry to get the formal degree. Um, but that was my experience working for Blue Labs. Um, social scientists who stumbled into data science and who learned through practice and through application um, and to, to excel in the industry. You know, ironically, at, at Florida State University, where I got my degrees, uh, the economics actually within the school of social sciences, not the school of business. A lot of schools is in the school of business. But it's in the school of social science because, at the end of the day, economics really is it's a it's a it's a it's a theory of how society deals with and interfaces with economic situations, conditions, aspects, right? And and of course, it just so happens too they use very deeply a lot of statistical tools to to drive that analysis. But but it's you know it, it's very much. Uh, interesting aspect that economics can, depending on the school, be either in the school of business or in the school of social sciences. Um, and and so, and, and one thing that's interesting too is I realized um, is that a lot of social sciences use the same tools, use the same because you know a lot of analysis of social conditions, you know, to really you know be accepted in academia, you have to put math behind it, <laughs> you have to put models behind it, and and uh, and and it has to look complicated on a, on, a, on, a, on a wider traditional chalkboard right <laughs> so you know so that's very, you know so that's why a lot of times especially if you get a if you go make it as far as getting a graduate degree in whatever particular social science you 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 will interface enough with with statistical things that make you a pretty you know it's not too hard to then transition to analytics yeah and I think you agree with that Cass yeah yeah mm -hmm. so 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 yeah so Further to keep on going. So now you spent so many years uh, doing what you're doing in this sort of political analysis sort of role. And then what triggered it? What? You know, how recently did you decide to you know start IT analytics? And I don't know if you if you left the the did you quit? Like walk us through that. The birth of IT analytics. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So I have been thinking through IET analytics for a number of years, um, for the past two years, in fact, thinking about how I could use my skills, expertise to benefit Haiti. I feel like every decision I've made has been with Haiti in mind and choosing to pivot into working in IT was no different. Um, so when I started at Blue Labs, I knew then that whatever skills I acquire here would somehow service work that I would do later on in Haiti. Um, and so I began to talk to different sort of stakeholders within the IT sector in Haiti to figure out where I could find a niche for myself because I didn't want to sort of propose a solution to a problem that wasn't fully well-defined. 
Um, so I spent the past two years um, doing a listening tour, as Nadine Paul de Wally might say. Um, I spoke to perhaps 120 plus stakeholders from university professors to um, leaders in the IT sector, so Mac Alain. Um, I spoke to successful entrepreneurs, everyone who was considered to be a leader in the tech space in Haiti. I got on a call with them and asked, what do you, what do you identify as a problem? Um, what do you see as a need within the tech um, sector in Haiti? And so I spent the past two years refining um, the idea to what has materialized to be IET analytics. Um, so there were two conversations that sort of sparked why data science should be my domain in Haiti. Um, one sort of conversation as part of the listening tour was a talk that I had with Patrick Atier. He's the director of um, Ecole Infotonique um, in Haiti, which is a leading technical school. And he told me that they're graduating brilliant students, but they graduate them and they're unemployed. And a number of them leave the country to pursue further education abroad. And so I heard him saying they have talented youth who can't find jobs. And then I had had a conversation with the HR director at Digicel just a few weeks later. And he said, they're looking to fill vacancies. They can't find um, talent locally to do data um, analysis. Like they need people to build dashboards. They need people to manipulate model, visualize data. They can't find that locally. They're thinking to hire expats. And for me, it just seemed like an obvious, like a spark happened where I thought, okay, they're graduating talent. Digicel has opportunity but there's this sort of skills gap in between. Um, can perhaps I propose something to help fill that skills gap where you take the most talented youth, the talented graduates from uh, technical schools, funnel them through a data science boot camp, and connect them to employers like Digicel. And that's what originally inspired IET Analytics. It was originally just an education program. Um, I wanted to connect youth to opportunity. Um, and it's since expanded to be so much more than that. Um, but again, what inspired IT analytics was these series of conversations with different stakeholders um, and me spending the two years thinking about how I could best serve um, or best fill an existing need. I, lo I love that. Uh, and again, again I, that's why I sing your praises there, Cass, because, you know, you do what I can, I can, I, you know, anyone who reaches out to me. <clears throat> Oh, I, 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 you know, saw your content, see Gen T, I, you know, I want to, want to come back to Haiti. And then the uh, first question I ask: so first off, what is it that you have an idea to do? And, and, and then the second question is usually what's your level of engagement with the country? Yeah, man, I haven't been there in 10 years. I don't really know what, what I want to do, man. <laughs> and it's like, okay, you haven't really been watching my content then, because if you did, then you realize my number one thing I tell folks is get to know the country you know, be inquisitive, you know, engage, spend at least a year, love that you took, you took two. And, and then naturally the intersection between your experience background, the need of, of, of the market that may exist in the country and the opportunity for, for money and the business model behind those three things will, will coalesce to, to an idea that you can then act on and then potentially pitch others to, to engage and be a part of. It sounds like that's exactly the pathway that you took, yeah. Yeah, um, and ultimately this was guided again by doing market research. Um, what I didn't wanna do was what sort of NGOs would typically do where they have a solution that was prepackaged and simply transplanted to Haiti. Um, so that's the reason why um, I spent time doing groundwork and it's something that I'd recommend for anyone wanting to do work in Haiti. Find out who the movers and shakers are, see if you can partner or add value in some other way. Um, but I felt that what we were doing wasn't being offered by an existing organization. Um, and so I felt fully confident sort of building this company out with that mission of training youth and, and sort of taking the leap of moving to Haiti to, to implement on that mission. I love it. I love it. And that's, and that's truly one of the reasons why, um, you know, cause I think it sounds like, you know, I want to ask this question. So the folks you're engaging, how did you approach them? Because a lot of times they, they get inundated with so many people trying to contact them, right? Particularly, you know, folks, someone like Mark Allen, who's very much in the social media. And I can speak to that myself. Like every other day, I'm getting someone reaching out to me. So how did you engage them to get their attention? Because I'm sure a lot of people who may also want to, you know, inquiry with someone. What's the best way to approach someone who's um, in the public and, or maybe, you know, I think maybe someone in the private might be a little easier, but I don't know what, how did you go about 
engaging all these different parties? Was it in person? Was it just a random DM? How did how did you go? <laughs> that's a that's a really good question. I'm trying to remember now. Like, how did I get um, on a phone call with some of these really incredible people? Um, I was fortunate to have the international capital, so to speak, of having graduated from Stanford. I think that opened a lot of doors where people were more receptive to to me as an individual because I had that prestige. Wait, so did you um, just say, hey, I'm from Stanford, like as your first opening sentence? Like, how does that feel? <laughs> Sometimes, yes. And then people would open the door and let me in. But no, um, often it was being introduced by someone who they regarded highly. So um, as I mentioned, Patrick Atier was an early sort of believer in IT analytics. Um, he was one of the first stakeholders I spoke with and he introduced me to everyone else within his network. So I was really fortunate to mm, have those okay. And if you know sort of Patrick, he's a big shot um, within the tech industry. And so being introduced by him meant that I had something of value to say. Um, and so he did a number of introductions to, um, again, to Digicel, to Societe Bank, other employers in Haiti. And they, they got on the call with me as a result. Um, Mark Alain was just great from the beginning. Um, I actually think I may have just walked in, wandered into Bunch, told them the business idea. He sat down and gave me advice and we, he's been mentoring me since. So I think it's a combination of uh, the prestige of being foreign educated, being introduced by important stakeholders. So the, the aspect of who you know. And thirdly, just people in Haiti being open to partnering and to listening to different or innovative ideas. Um, and the combination of those three things has led to me expanding my network and um, really feeling like I'm in a place where I know people and I can add value to what existing uh, sort of innovations are out there. So, and so using the network of your network, I love it. That's that's very yes. interesting. <laughs> very and and, and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. And I'm willing to extend this network to others as well. So now mm -hmm. I feel like I, I have to pay it forward. <laughs> mm -hmm, for sure. And that's another thing too, though, you know, I can't stress enough as well to a lot of, especially when young folks reach out to me who are in college or just about to graduate. And I always tell them, great, cool. I love the passion you have for Haiti, but focus on being as big of a success as you can in America first, right? Finish your schooling, get top marks. If you can go to, you know, you know, continue your education, go to a graduate school, you know, as, as, as high of enough graduate school that you can afford and you can actually get into. And then once you're done with that, spend a couple years, you know, in your profession, saving money, accruing accolades, becoming a respected leader in your profession, and then use in that entire social capital and in real capital, right? Because you're hopefully you're making enough money where you start investing and paying down debts and stuff to allow you to then have a relatively stress-free transition into the country. Because the worst thing you want to do is, is you know, be working in, I guess, a nine to five job at Walgreens and then decide, you know, just wake up one day and say, I'm just going to move out there. And that's the worst because, again, you don't have much social capital, you don't have much real capital, right? And it's extremely, uh, you, know, I, you know, everyone should be able to re-engage in the country um, the way that they can. But you know, it's to do it the right way and to maximize your chance of success. You want to be first, be successful in where you're at. One of my favorite quotes, in fact, uh, has to be Johnson Napoleon, uh, who said, there's, you know, there's more than just one Haiti. There's Haiti's in so many different communities that you're in and work on first potentially helping that Haitian, you know, you're growing up in South Florida, you know, that is potentially a little, I mean, there is literally a little Haiti in South Florida. We know that. But then Broward, there's a Haitian community. Mark is from Philadelphia. He's there's certainly a one, two, several subsets of Haitian communities. Mark can certainly cite, right? You know, you know, New York, I think just passed a little Haiti uh, in the Brooklyn area or something. So certainly maximizing your chances there by doing what you can there, but and then eventually transitioning back to to actual Haiti, right? But first being the sex first, and, and that's what she, it sounds like you certainly did cast. So that's important. I want to make sure folks really listen to that aspect and just don't, don't, uh, don't miss that at all. Right. And yeah, so and I, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I just want to echo that. Um, I had a number of the same stakeholders tell me uh, to wait to sort of mature career wise, um, save money, don't rush to come to Haiti. Um, and for me, it was a very calculated decision. Um, 
So I could have waited even longer, uh, but for me, it just felt like the right time, uh, the right convergence of everything um, to launch in 2020. Um, but that's an advice that's often widely wisely given. Um, take your time, because transitioning to living in Haiti is going to be challenging. You want to make sure that you can support yourself financially um, while you're build, building out your venture. Um, yeah, so it's, it's good advice. Um, I don't know if I stuck to it exactly, because I still am fairly young. Um, but to me, it just, it made sense to sort of dive in when I did. So before I really get it, you start really talking about IT analytics. First and foremost, how do you describe th that analytics, like data analysis? Like how do you, how do you describe that to someone? First of all, like the domain that I, cause I kind of alluded to it. I probably should have opened up the whole show with that definition first. Cause a lot of folks don't know what analytics is. So, Break that down to us, you know, first, what is it? Um, yeah, so I would say that data science or data analytics is the use of data to understand uh, some problem that you're trying to sort of solve. Um, and this is varied by industry. Um, so one thing I wanna stress is that data science looks very different in terms of the types of questions you would ask if you're working in health versus working in telecommunications. Uh, but it's ultimately it's using data to derive insight. Um, and so a lot of the experience that I have is working with um, voter registry data. So given someone's level of education, given their um, voting history, what's their likelihood of voting Democratic? So it's using uh, data from the voter file to derive insight, to make some sort of prediction about your likelihood of future votes. Um, so that's what it looks like within the political science domain. Okay. Yeah, I, I, when folks ask me, that and if I if I see it's someone who <laughs> can really appreciate it that definition usually I just again I just say hey I'm in IT and folks get IT right um, <laughs> even though it's, it's very much not very you know it's not at all really what I what what I do but but when I can really provide a full definition I, here's what I use I say hey listen it's a, it's, a, I, it's a process that you know I do that and that, that analysis. And, and to define that analysis is the process of inspecting, cleansing, transforming, modeling data with the goal of discovering useful information and informing conclusions and support decision making. That, that is what I do, right? That is, that is what that analysis is, right? It's literally that first aspect of taking information in, a da in data form. And anyway, you take data, just you know, Excel spreadsheet, right? And new numbers and characters, right? Cleaning that up to make it useful, right? And that is organizing it. Um, structuring it in a way to make it genuinely useful in a repetitive way, right? And then again, the goal always is to derive useful information that you didn't realize. For example, if you're in a grocery store, you realize that, hey, soda pop is sold more on Tuesdays than it is on Thursdays, right? Some stuff like that you wouldn't necessarily have noticed if you weren't really in that data, just, you know, tinkering around and seeing things. And then, and then once you have that conclusion now, okay, well, Okay, soda pops one on one day or another. Now, what can you do to take advantage of it? So, so in, to sell more soda pop, maybe I need to put that soda pop up front to make it even more accessible, right? Um, or maybe try to compound that soda pop with something else that co is correlated with that soda pop, right? And again, but that's when that final piece of decision making comes in, where you're then helping drive that decision making with that with that manager or that person in charge of being able to decide where to put things. Right. And that and that ultimately is data. And that's why, again, y y if you notice, that's all critical thinking at the end of the day. Right. And that's why anybody really who has a capacity to critically think can transition into it. So is that is that you, you agree with what I said so far? Yes, definitely. It's taking information and transforming it to insight, I think, at its core. Um, awesome. And I like that you said that data comes in so many different forms. Um, so often it's tabular. So an Excel sheet, but there's also photo data. Um, and if you're working in sort of biology, you have genetic data that you're working with. So again, by industry, the type of data that you're working with might be different, but the end goal is to get insight. How can you use this to uh, improve decision-making or um, yeah, what can you, what story can you tell given the, the data that's available, the modeling that you've done um, and so forth? I love it, I love it. I love Thank it. you guys. Thank you guys for sharing that definition for those who are like me and don't come from a, a data science analysis background, very helpful. 
Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. No, no, hopefully, we're, we're not. <laughs> I'm trying to keep this at a level where our audience who may not be of a data science, statistical, math background don't, doesn't get lost. So we're, we're not doing that, Mark. You, you're still with us? <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds like I'm going to take that sign list for Mark as a yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Yes, for there sure. You go, there we go. <laughs> All right. So so now that we understand and we have a definition of what analytics is tr generally now. All right. So now you had these these contacts that sort of helped you decide, OK, analytics is where you want to go. And now are right, you decided. So what's next now? You're actually then because I know you have a few different partners, in IT analytics. I'm not sure how you got them on board. Like, tell us now, you know, just now that you decided you, you're going to do it. Walk us through its birth and its start. Okay, uh, that's. I love the question. Um, so again, as I mentioned, I spent uh, the past two years putting in groundwork, doing market research, um, and I think what I needed at the time um, before I decided this is something I'm going to commit to is um, a co-founder. So um, I wanted a, a co-founder who had more experience working in the industry. Who could complement my set of skills? And last year, um, I met someone who I thought filled that role. Um, I was also looking for funding, so I, I had a, num a, a checklist. Like I'm not going to commit to doing this unless I have these things in place. So having a, a co-founder, having grant funding to support us in the first year. So I applied to grant funding through this foundation in the U.S. Received it to cover um, our first year of operations. I said, okay, check. Um, I wanted to get partnership commitments from employers in Haiti. Um, I got that from Digicel. They were willing and ready to hire from um, our first boot camp, which is, again, what inspired IT analytics to begin with. So I got the employer partnerships and those three things. And I thought, I'm not going to get these three things to align again. Um, maybe this is a universe telling me that this is time for me to launch this venture. Again, we had the funding. Um, I, we had sort of an executive team, myself and my now co-founder, Morgan Mendes. Um, and we have uh, support from employers in Haiti. So um, I formally resigned from uh, my job in DC in December, moved to Haiti in January, and I've been running ever since. I love it. I love it. Congratulations. Felicitations. <laughs> merci, merci. Yeah, a lot of things align there that, um, you know, I, I, you know, that wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, <laughs> It's it's a, you know I'm happy that that it happened. So let's break that piece down. So the grant piece, you know, because all these uh, would be very helpful for folks to, to to try to consider in their strategies. The grant piece, how did you just was it just a Google search? You just how did that? How did you come to learn about that particular grant? Yeah. Um, so I I want to say a quote first before I answer that question. There's this famous quote um, from The Alchemist that says. If you can, if you want something badly enough, the universe will conspire in your favor. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's what has happened with IT analytics. So with the grant funding, I remember putting it out into the universe and a friend sent me a link to a grant that the Rodenberry Foundation was awarding to early stage entrepreneurs. Um, it's unrestricted funds. So they give you the money, you do what you choose and you report to them at the end of the year. Um, so I applied to that fund and got it um, after several rounds, but it literally, it kind of fell into my lap. Um, I remember thinking, we're stuck. We want to launch this uh, company in Haiti, but I don't have funding. And then the friend forwarded me the link to apply to the Rodenberry grant, and we got it a few months later. Um, so it was a product of, again, ex telling my network what my needs were um, and allowing them to help and support me. Awesome, awesome. Um, and that's one thing that I can appreciate about you, Cass, because I don't know, you have an energy that really you know, old people we really are drawn to you. I can say that, you know, versus me, I'll be, you know, folks, <laughs> I am not, I'm actually pretty much introverted, you know, not that social actually in real life. <laughs> so I have much more of a mindset of I'm gonna go in it alone. <laughs> I'm gonna go, I'm just going to get started. And, and anyone who, who sees what I'm doing and wants to come in cool, if they don't, don't. <laughs> so certainly playing your personality is important. So it's one to know your, who, what your personality is and and energy you have, and I'm certainly of one. That's one reason why I had to sort of get my own funding. Funding, you know, uh, and it's it's I don't know. It's some it's some pluses and negatives for sure. And and my which leads to my next question now, as because you said you, you look for a co-founder, right? And and I know a lot of people 
you know, one of some of the most common things I hear when it comes to starting a business is sometimes they partner with the wrong co-founder or wrong, wrong partner. And so how did you find your current partner and how, and how do you, how did you know it was right? How did you, cause so far I, I've seen your interactions with, with, you, you can say his name if you want to. Um, it seems you guys really do have that simpatico. Um, but so how did you find, uh, and know this was the person who, you know, is going to be able to help get you that next level. Yeah. Again, this is going back to the universe, just conspiring. Um, so I'm just really grateful for, uh, my network. So I had a, a friend at the time who was working for a nonprofit in Haiti, um, and she forwarded me someone's uh, LinkedIn profile. And she said, you know, I remember you telling me about the data science firm idea in Haiti. This guy's brilliant. He's a former VP of data science in the US. He's Haitian. He wants to move back to Haiti. Maybe you both should talk. Um, and so she introduced us. I reached out to him at the time I was living in DC. Um, he was also in DC. So all of these things are aligning. We met up for coffee the day after we were introduced and hit it off immediately. So I think it's a matter of, of having an aligned vision and we did immediately. So we sat down for coffee. I told him about the vision of IT analytics. Um, I had this idea to train a new generation of, of technologists in Haiti. I want to train, connect them to opportunity. And then he added to that and said, yeah, what if we could also do consulting? And so immediately in, in Morgan, I found a, a thought partner um, in that he took the idea, helped me mold it into um, what it is now. So we're not only doing education, but we're doing consulting and public research in the domain, in the field of data science. So it was having that immediate connection, having that immediate alignment in our vision and mission for what we're building. Um, and that all happened over coffee. So, <laughs> um, and we would spend the next, uh, five months sort of refining and building out the business model. And we both moved to Haiti um, early this year. So um, yeah, so it's, it was the perfect combination of things. Was, was, um, was, was Morgan also um, of Haitian descent? Uh, was, was he at all entered, you know, had some history with Haiti or was he brand new to, to the country? Yeah, he is Haitian diaspora as well. Um, the story is different from mine, um, but um, this was also a return for him in, in some awesome. ways. Awesome. So two, two Haitian. I got to put Morgan on the list to eventually get Morgan on the program as well. Any, any opportunity I can just talk data and incorporate with with uh, with with the, you know C Genty and the Haitian diaspora return <laughs> conversation we like to have here, the better, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's great. So so I okay cool. So yeah so. I see now it's set up, you have the right partners, everything has come together. Now it exists, IT analysts exist. So now that first year um, sounds, cause I know recently you guys did a training program with so many students and, and I'm not sure if you've gotten already some contracts with consulting yet. So walk us through this first year. How has it been? What, what, what's, what's, what has the success has been? What have you wrote out? You know, talk to us about that. Yeah. Um, so, I'll just do sort of a broad overview in terms of the types of programs that we offer. As I mentioned, we have three pillars. We have education, consulting, and research. And for this, the first and second quarter, we wanted to focus a lot on education. We want to train a foundation of, of data scientists and data analysts before we can do the really interesting work of applied analytics. So in um, March, we launched our data science boot camp, uh, which is the first of its kind in Haiti. Um, and the goal was to train a cohort of data analysts, connect them to employers in the country. Um, so my team and I were a team of six. We spent all of January and February prepping for the boot camp, so building out the curriculum, doing outreach. We had a three-stage uh, application cycle. Um, so we selected the top 15 candidates. We were ready to launch. Um, and one of the greatest challenges we've had to deal with uh, these past few months, as you can imagine, is COVID-19. Um, after spending months prepping for the boot camp, getting the employer partners to sign contracts, recruiting students, you have a global pandemic. Um, so we've we've managed to sort of migrate the boot camp entirely online. Um, the intention was to have it be classroom instruction, but circumstances didn't allow. Um, so we now have a completely online cohort, and we're still on track to train the first generation of data scientists in Haiti. And our employer partners are just as engaged. They're just as ready to hire out of the boot camp. That's in awesome. addition, yeah, in addition to the boot camp, we've also done a number of public education programming. 
So in January and February, we started doing meetups. So these are more casual and they're free, open to the public. So meetups for us was a way to reach a broader audience than just a few students we would reach through the boot camp. So um, we partnered with Impact Hub Poto Points and we use their facility to do meetups every first and third Saturday of the month. Um, I think the first session we had in January, there was standing room only. We had about 50 people come. And if you've been to Impact Hub, you know that the, the space that we would use is very small. Um, and so 50 people there meant that they were, were willing to stay and, and sort of learn despite it being perhaps not ideal um, comfort wise. But um, for us, it was just a, a huge validation of what we, we were doing was needed by the community. And so we've been doing the, we stopped doing the meetups formally um, in March because of COVID, but um, we did them consistently twice a month, first and third Saturdays, teaching a, a wide range of different skills. So Python programming, um, introduction to statistics um, and so forth. Uh, so the meetups and the boot camps were all part of the education programming. As I mentioned, that's what we wanted to focus on primarily uh, to make sure we build that foundation. Uh, before doing some of the more interesting work that we want to do a uh, longer term. I love it. I love it. Um, so yes, yeah, you guys are very aggressively engaged there. Uh, the training program, is it, I think it's just about finished, right? Uh, I know you, it's currently happening now, right? Is it, is it finished already? Um, no. Uh, so one thing that I should say is migrating online has been quite the challenge. So we've had to extend the program. So our original graduation date was, uh, today actually, what's today's date? Yeah, May 30th, uh, but we've extended it uh, by two months. So we're looking to graduate our students uh, July 30th. Um, so one thing that you you probably would both know is that um, connectivity isn't great in Haiti. Um, so for a number of our students, they won't be able to work at the same pace that they would if we had the physical lab that we could work from. Um, Digicel has agreed to cover uh, internet plans for our students to make connectivity less of an issue. Um, but if it's not connectivity, some of them have pro other problems that they don't have a device at home. Electricity. So you don't have a laptop. Mm -hmm. And then electricity. If, you're, if you get electricity once a week, mm -hmm. then you can't realistically make as much progress. So we've done as much as we can to provide them with support. So again, Digicel has reopened the computer lab that they sort of built out for the boot camp, And we now have a rotation where select students can use the lab to um, make progress on the online course. Right. Um, we're not requiring it. It's just they're unavailable for those students who don't have reliable enough electricity or if they don't have a device at home. Yeah. Um, we've also engaged Digicel to, um, again, cover um, a monthly internet plan for students who can't afford that on their own. So we've done all that we can to provide the support and infrastructure that students wouldn't otherwise have. But this means that we can't go at the pace that we intended. So rather than graduating them in three months, we're looking to graduate them in five months. Um, yeah, and that's and that's one of the things when it comes to Haiti, you know, the realities of, of doing business there and, and just trying to do initiatives like this um, in regular times, it can be tricky. And, and, and when you think you've solved it right, then life, <laughs> the world, the country um, throws things at you that then, you know, um, kind of like a bully who puts you against the wall. <laughs> what you going to do now? huh? And then you got to fight back. You still got to fight back despite the odds that are, you know, surmount. And it sounds like you are doing that. You are, you know, creating dynamically in real time, you know, trying to figure out ways to allow your participants to be able to, to engage. And that is certainly commendable and something that folks need to hear about is that, listen, hey, you're not easy. <laughs> Given the things you just mentioned, electricity, internet, da, 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 da. And, uh, and you're still you know, fighting a way through that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're committed. If anything, we, we thought about formally stopping the program. Uh, so uh, two months into the boot camp when there was the first, con sorry, two weeks into the boot camp when there was the first confirmed case in Haiti, um, my team and I, we kind of regrouped and thought maybe this is a sign that we should formally stop the program. Um, and when we announced that to students, like a soft announcement, they were interested in doing online. So they're the ones who pushed us to keep it going in some other way. Um, in the two weeks that we were able to launch and sort of do the classroom um, instruction and the applied projects that we weaved into the curriculum, they were staying late, they were engaged, they were asking really great questions, and they didn't want that to end. So um, we continued online at their request. Yeah, that's, uh, 
uh, great to hear, right? And now you know you'll, you'll be at the you'll be you know hopefully. Uh, you, so is it the entire class? If they pass, you know the criteria, are they all going to then have a chance to work at Digicel, or or how you know what's the what's the plan for for the folks who finish? Maybe a percentage does this, and then percentage does something else. How does that? How do you envision that uh, panning out? Yeah, uh, great question. So we are guaranteeing a paid internship for every graduate of the boot camp, and we're in a position to do so. Um, so Didishal will hire half of the cohort, and the remaining will work for IET analytics and data analyst internship capacity. Um, so again, with the grant funding that we have, we can hire them in that role. And so we've committed to students that if they can get through the uh, five-month program, if they can complete their applied capstone project, um, they're guaranteed a paid internship at the end of it. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, and so, and, and since we're round out the round out the conversation, you know, I know IT and Links have done some pretty interesting stuff. You know, you know, rounding out the, the what what the entire book of business is. For example, I know recently you you published online a uh, what was that a medical um, health systems dashboard. Yeah, talk about that. That was very cool. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I would say is that although sort of launching during a pandemic has been challenging, it has brought about some opportunities. Um, so when COVID hit Haiti, um, when my team and I regrouped, in addition to thinking about how to transition the how to transition the boot camp online, we began thinking about how we can use data to inform the public. Like for us, we feel as if as a data science firm, we have a responsibility um, to produce information tools. And so we pivoted uh, rather quickly to thinking about ways that we can inform the public. And health data was one of the obvious sort of uh, things to focus on. Um, so we managed to procure data from uh, a health survey that's done every few years, administered by USAID and the Haitian Ministry of Health. And we built a dashboard that shows a distribution of health facilities by department and by commune. And um, although it's still under development, we'll also be releasing data on health personnel, um, hospital beds, uh, which facilities have gowns or another personal protective material, which facility has running water. So we have a lot of health and population data that we want to visualize and put on our dashboard to inform the public. Um, and this, we hope, will help guide the conversation about how prepared Haiti is to respond to, um, you know, pandemics like COVID-19. Um, but it's also a useful tool to know what the existing health capacity is. And so even um, we've gotten sort of really positive feedback. A lot of people didn't know that the West Department had, of course, the lion's share of health facilities, but also the lion's share of hospitals. Um, and so it's a really great tool that can help guide conversations about uh, resource allocation um, and health advocacy um, in Haiti. Um, and so we're really proud of it as our first data product. I love it. I love it. And, and, it's, and what's so important is the fact that, you know, there needs to be an attack on both sides, right? An attack on both sides, meaning there, there, there is a necessity for some rudimentary businesses, the business development in the country, for example, agriculture and manufacturing, these sort of repetitive things. But then there's also this massive need for the other side, which is bringing in sort of that critical thinking, higher, you know, the, the, the IT, the data, the apps, the um, analysis, the research, I mean, you know, the creation of patents, you know, that can drive, uh, you know, the, the ability to, to have our academics, our universities create research that them itself is citable, right? And so there's sort of higher level analysis needed. And then and eventually they're going to meet at the center. And the center is a, a growing um, diverse economy that can, can really help improve the entire ship. Uh, of the Haitian people. <laughs> and so that's why, you know, I, I enjoy very much, you know, hearing about what IET Analytics is doing. I always keep very close tabs on the different things you guys announce. And, and, I, and I know, again, this COVID has been just a pain, you know, and, and to have for it to happen during your first class is, uh, I'm sure you're not happy about, <laughs> but I can tell you, you have a great story. And certainly, um, uh, I think it will add incredible, incredible credibility to, um, you know, your future, because especially as you get folks out and completed, you know, adds certainly a degree of uh, credibility is the word uh, to your reputation that this, that no matter what happens, you can still overcome it and, and produce uh, stellar 
candidates who are then going to hopefully stay with Digicel for a long time and help drive profitability and operational efficiency and, and et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're just scratching the surface. Um, so I think what I'm particularly, and I would hope Morgan is particularly excited about, is what our graduates will go on to do beyond the boot camp. Um, so what they'll go on to do in their roles at Digicel, but also what they'll do while directly employed at IET Analytics. We have a number of interesting projects that we're excited to have them work on in their internship. Um, I, I won't say them all now, but we, we're being very ambitious in terms of uh, building out a language model for Haitian Creole, doing a public facilities inventory, um, building a data inventory so that if you want data on health or on education, you have a repository that you can go to um, for that. So we have ideas that are just through the roof. We're thinking as ambitiously as possible. Um, all we need to do is to train the talent to really help execute on these different um, projects. So I'm really excited about where we'll go beyond the boot camp. Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly hope at some point, um, you know, not only will you get more engagement from the business community there, right? And But then also the government can use a lot of this analysis, Haitian government, right? And so maybe get some opportunities to help them with uh, a lot of gestion uh, uh, that they are trying to are having to do, right? Um, if I just, just mm -hmm. want to jump, I just want to say um, thank you because I mean I've just been listening in. I, I'm I'm definitely I don't come back I don't come from that background of data science and data analysis, and so it's really interesting to listen and to see how it's being um, outworked in Haiti. So thank you for that. Um, what can what can people who don't come from that background, how can they support? Um, what can the diaspora do to further the work um, that you that you and IT analytics are doing? Um, yeah, so I think a lot of what we could use um, now at this stage is uh, partnerships. So a lot of the projects that we want to do, we want to implement um, with partners. So if anyone within the diaspora, whether you're a technologist or a data scientist or otherwise, have an interest in working with IET analytics, please reach out. Um, I think working collaboratively is one of our core values. Um, and so for every project we do, whether it's building out the language model or doing the public facilities inventory, we would like to do it with a domain partner. Um, so if anyone has listened to this and, and sort of thinks our mission resonates, uh, please reach out. Um, we can brainstorm how we might collaborate in the future. Um, yeah, that's probably the, the most obvious uh, way to, to engage with us as, as members of the diaspora. Meaning it sounds like if, if someone has a, you know, in a position of leadership in their company and, and they're looking to, you know, get, you know, very efficient critical thinkers who can do a lot of the things that, uh, you know, poor creation and, um, statistical analysis, everything, but then do it at a at a price point that is much less than a typical American, but still very very comfortable for a Haitian. It sounds like that's probably your ideal relationship, maybe. Yeah, it could be doing a joint project, or it could be in a consulting capacity. So um, if they're looking to hire analysts from Haiti at a fraction of the cost, um, we're also open to that as well. So. Okay. Collaborative projects, consultations, if anyone is interested in exploring those, um, I can share some of like our, our contact information to follow up. We will. We will get, we'll put all that in the in the description below for sure, ways to get in contact with IT Analytics and Costa and, and all the different uh, points of potential um, work that can I mean, imagine it, for example, if you're working on your thesis and you need someone to help with analysis, and that's something I'm sure analytics can help out with. The list goes on and on, right? Because again, they're, they're, they're building critical thinkers. And one thing that um, you know I, I didn't share was that again, given that I'm, I'm in this domain now, particularly in curriculum engineering uh, for this uh, Israeli online university uh, in data science and data analytics, I'm sure Cass and I will be working somehow together, <laughs> you know, in the near future to help uh, round out some things as well. Just you know, it makes too much sense not to, right? So. Yeah. so <laughs> so maybe we'll have you help build out our curriculum for future cohorts. Hey, something that we <laughs> that could be a potential partnership. <laughs> you know, look out for that. If you guys want to 
um, inter intersect with CGNT somehow, you know, do it through, do it through IIT analytics guys, those who are listening. Yeah. And so, so yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, we, we went a little bit over, but I, I'm surprised. I thought honestly we would have went two hours knowing how much I like talking about the subject. So I'm, I'm giving myself a pat on the back for <laughs> kind of keeping and Mark too. Thanks Mark for keeping the conversation on track and on point there. I can tell you this conversation has been very fantastic in the sense that we talked about uh, not just this very niche sort of uh, profession, which is analytics, uh, though it has more and more general importance and appeal in the, in, the, in the business world that we're in. But more importantly, we talked about these real, real strategies that anybody, no matter what they're doing, should emulate. The fact that we talked about how, uh, you know, CAS built a degree of success in the States first and foremost both through her education and professional. We talked about how when she decided to engage in the country, she took a very slow, methodical approach where she visited the country, where she networked with people. She really built that trust because Haiti is very much built with trust. And no one talks about that enough to build that trust. And then and then when she engaged uh, in the country, she did also very methodically make sure she had the funds available. She dedicated her time uh, to, because you know, that's what she had. She quit, you know, what she was doing, focused on it, but first also ensured that, you know, there was a business model there and also there was money there through this grant. And then, and then she, once she's been in there, she's been in this uh, mode of reacting to the realities of Haiti, right? Given COVID, COVID is something nobody could have imagined, but the fact that she's had to then react and shift, strategize. These are all the things that make that are necessary to maximize your chance of success. And I'll tell you what, Cass is not some is not gonna be so I can tell you right now, it's, I'll say it right live on air. Cass is not gonna be someone who's gonna fail and then go back and talk very negatively about the country and the oh, you know, you can't do this. There's a mafia of people who will block you. No, Cass is doing it the way that it's going to maximize her chance of success, despite all the um incredible once in generational, you know pandemics that's that's hitting her right now and that's and i can't stress that enough for folks who really need that guide and path uh to to overcoming right and that's what i got out of it um you know cast what, what you want to add <laughs> what did i miss <laughs> that oh yeah something. i think that was, that was well said um i just want to sort of share that if there are diaspora out there who want to do work in haiti who want to return and, and do something meaningful um you can do it so it just takes planning. It takes uh, doing your preliminary research. So rather than diving in with the solution, um, better assess what the needs and or assets are before going in. Um, so th the listening tour for me, is, and I'm using Najeen Paul's term um, for this, the listening tour for me was perhaps the most enlightening part in helping to guide where I could be most useful. Um, it helped me to identify a need um, and I could use my specific sets of skills to fulfill that need. Um, so yeah, it's possible there are going to be challenges. So every day there's a new set of challenges for me about like, living in Haiti and um, being able to acclimate, um, but also there are uh, challenges related to IET analytics and doing business in Haiti, um, but it's all worth it. At the end of the day, when I think about our students, it's all worth it. I feel as if the impact that I'm able to make in Haiti, it it's so much more profound. Um, than any other, than the impact I might have stateside. I love it. I love it. Mark, yeah, what's your final well, thoughts, brother? I, I mean, I've, I've, I've been blessed just be, to be able to learn, um, to listen and hear of all that you're doing and the impact that it's having, and also to learn a bit more about um, IT and data and all that. So really encouraged, um, and I really want to encourage you as well. Continue doing the great work you're doing. Um, you have all the resources. Um, and you know that you need and I'll be praying that God will send even more resources to do that um, You know important work for our young people um, In Haiti and hopefully when things get back to normal and we're able to get back home. We can connect back on the island Yes <laughs> Beautifully said I love it. I love it and then everyone of uh, those who um, uh, I want to know who we're talking to in the, in the program. Uh, it was Castellin Tilus and ietanalytics.org, IET spelled A Y I T I analytics, right? Dot org. And you see the website, you see you know the, the discussions of the program, 
um, and a lot of different services they offer and, and looking to grow into. So I can't uh, stress enough the importance of you know checking that out. And if you can't support in any particular way, uh, just certainly do that. Uh, as always, the Haitian, my people at IET, the Haitian diaspora, living in Haiti podcast. If you made it this far, I want to appreciate you. I want to say I appreciate you. We appreciate you to, to listen to the discussion that I was certainly passionate about. And, and we are on all these different mediums, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, was it uh, Google Podcasts, Spotify, if I mentioned that already. Uh, we're also on you know, YouTube and Facebook. We're on all these different mediums. So however you're listening to it, hit that like, hit that thumbs up, share this conversation. You know, you're not going to find this discussion of analytics in Haiti anywhere else on the entire interwebs. So so this is the sort of you know fun and uniqueness that we're able to bring to the discussion of advancement of the country. And of course, we're going to be here for quite some time as COVID continues to ravage the world as a whole and prevent other certain content to, to be produced. We're going to still be at it. And even afterwards, we're still going to always be bringing these just awesome guests to, to come and share their conversations. Castellin, I want to thank you so much. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. And and that's the, that's the end of our show. Until we're back at it again, guys, we'll be back at it again.